Hi, welcome back to the last one. Now we continue our debate on Black Lives Matters movement, but right here in the uh, UK, obviously we all know why it was kicked off bigger than it is. It was always there though. Uh, kicked off by the brutal racist and tragic murder of 46 year old George Floyd in the States in the hands of, uh, at the hands of the police officers back in May. The incident made global uh, um, impact uh, in terms of systemic racism and inequalities. Um, but over here, we continue to make peaceful uh, demonstrations and marches, and we've been hearing some rather positive news about certain aspects. But um, every week, we focus on a particular aspect, and we want to focus this week on mental health. Thank you ever so much, um, you guys, for sending in questions, or comments, or whatever, because there's, there's a few. But I'm not sure we can go through all of them. Let's try and do our best. But what we want to do is to get our movers and shakers, our people that know what they're talking about, onto this and let's let's discuss this a bit more so um on the on the uh, show we we welcome um uh, uh cairo maynard health mental health therapist hi Cara, how are you i'm okay thanks how are you pam i'm fine fine thank you very much thank you so much i know you guys even this weekend i know you're busy i know you're busy um, we also welcome Sharon Bannister. And let me see if I can get this right. And Sharon will, will probably tell me if I get it wrong. Biodynamic craniosacral sacral therapist and a shiatsu practitioner. Shiatsu, yeah. Shiatsu. Practitioner. Well, well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome, Tina. We should be joined by Dr. Juliana um, on, on Wormer. Um, Yes, Dr. Julian Von Wormer, thank you, Queen's College London. Thank you ever so much, ladies, for joining us. We wanted to talk about this, and many people said, well, why haven't you done that yet? So we're doing it this week. We're looking at stats. We're looking at people we keep hearing news and, and, and um, you know, the, the press is out there saying that, you know, mental health issues is more uh, prevalent within black community. Um, is it really so? How do they know? you know, why are we looking at the black community so much so? What's going on? What's going wrong? Um, who wants to start me off with, is it prevalent within the black community with mental health issues? Who wants to kick me off on that one? Whoever wants to start off. I don't mind starting. Sharon, please do. Yes. Um, I say yes. The pressures are en enormous in London um, and in, in nationally. In my clinic, um, I tend to deal with stress, uh, post-traumatic stress, and all aspects of stress. Um, and there's a lot of people coming from the community suffering and really struggling with all the mixed messaging and subtle racism, I'd say. Not so subtle nowadays, but, you know, and the general pressures. And I think they feel a lot of them feel forgotten. I also deal a lot with adult adoptees. So if you're mixed nationality as I am, there's a lot of confusion and um, a lot of misconception. Um, and people hold a lot of stories that they haven't had a chance to say. And they've just been so sort of like, just, oh, just get on with it kind of thing. You know, or they've been heavily medicated. So, yeah. Um, racism and discrimination uh, is a factor. Social and economic inequalities is another one. But we've also got the criminal justice system um, mm -hmm. as well, and that plays a part. Who, who can enlighten me on that? Cairo, Dr. Juliana. Thanks, Pam. Um, sorry, you were just cutting out a little bit, so I think I just caught the last end of it. Um, I think it's still unfortunate that for many people who are accessing um, mental health services and certainly secondary mental health services, and if you are from a black and minority ethnic background, and particularly black African and black Caribbeans, you often find that you might access these services via the criminal justice system, which is um, an unfortunate um, situation for many people as their first access for mental health services. So, you know, um, many services 
are aware of this and certainly many practitioners are aware of this and really trying their best or think about different ways of trying to improve that situation because not only if you are feeling poorly yourself but to access a service via the criminal justice um, system can make things much worse. Mm. You know, the, the, the um, NOS, the National Office of Statistics, suggests that among 16 to 24 year olds, um, unemployment, um, we would go on to the social and economic inequalities, unemployment and things like that could um, make, um, you know, impact on, on, on a young person having that kind of mental health as uh, issue. Um, Cairo, you work with uh, young people, ch children and, and adolescents uh, in what you do. Um, it, it, do you find that it's with the older ones, unemployment, or is it other issues to do with family, um, the social aspects of family? Um, yeah, I'd say it's a mix of both, really. I work up to 18-year-olds, so I don't really go past 18-plus, um, and most of them at that point are still in school or in some form of education um, or sort of, yeah, working. And a lot of the stress is sort of maybe family pressures or issue, friendship issues and socialising along with um, sort of how they're getting on at school or not getting on very well at school. And that can be really stressful as well. If we're talking particularly now around the time of COVID um, and just having that uncertainty altogether of, you know, especially the, the older adolescents that I'm seeing, are they going to do exams? Are they not? What is their future going to look like? I've got a lot of young people who potentially may be going off to university in September or we will be leaving their school or their college. And there's loads of questions around what will they be doing next? And the future that maybe they had in their mind for themselves is is really unclear at the moment. And that is definitely impacting um, on just general stress and anxiety as well. Yeah. There is a stigma in the Caribbean community that, you know, you keep your, well, they call it your dirty linen indoors. You don't come out and talk about your mental health issues. It's, it's not quite the thing to do. Is that still really going on? Sharon? Definitely. 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 Um, when I've I've had quite a few people, sometimes uh, the stories that come out are quite are quite horrific, and you'll find you're the first person they've actually felt that they could talk to, they feel they've been listened to, held in a safe space, and then obviously work with other people and make sure they get as much support as possible. The way I deal with it when I have a client is I want to help them feel empowered and get back control of their their bodily functions. Because we, you know, we've got very powerful brains, and when we're in danger, it can do cranky things. You know, the amygdala kicks in, and that's it. Especially with the lockdown, because we've been told to stay indoors, keep safe, blah blah blah. But all your body's wanting to do is run from the tiger. So you've got mixed messaging, and it just you just go. You know, you're drinking too much. You're watching late night movies. You're watching the news. Too, you're going. Your head spinning. All these crazy things you'll start to do. And it's all natural because it's your body's trying to kick into fight and flight. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> Dr. Juliana? No, I totally would agree with what Sharon was saying. I think um, stigma is a really important issue. And in fact, it affects lots of communities. So it's not just specific within the Black and Asian minority groups, but it does play a quite an important role in terms of, you know, how it impacts on your ability to seek out help because you're, you can feel so concerned about what other people think about me or indeed if people were to know I was having these issues, whatever those issues might be, you might not even have a name for them, um, just a concern about what people might think about you or even indeed your families. And I think as a community, and I think you know, I commend you for doing this today, we all have a responsibility in terms of being able to stigmatise or demystify what are mental health problems. You know, we don't do, we don't treat mental health problems in the same way we do physical health problems. Yes, they are, they are problems that can be treated. And it's really unfortunate that just by, just because of your, your culture or your ethnicity, that you're then facing this other hurdle to access what 
because of unfavorable attitudes towards whatever experiences that you're having. I think it's so important that people just are able to speak to someone. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, a therapist as a straightforward way or a GP, but just someone initially just just to kind of share what's going on and then to be able to access help. Because often what happens is you sit on it for so long that by the time that you are accessing help, it might not necessarily be in the way that you would want to access that help. Mm -hmm. When we come to the criminal justice system, we're we're seeing that the percentage of um, young black males that, I mean, we know what's going on with uh, the stop and search or stop and question, whatever you want to call it. Um, and young black males always seemingly in the, the criminal uh, uh, judicial system, then being, um, you know, given sentences where they could have been given, you know, a sort of like a, a parole or, or, or a community sentence and think feeling as if they're uh, victimised. Actually, from that process on, it is being said that that damages them mentally. Um, Cairo, could, can, do you have any experience of any of your clients who would you say have had that experience and then they've, it's, it's gone the other way for them? It's made them, if you will, even worse. Um, yeah, so I, in, so I work in the child and adolescent mental health service and we do have a specific, um, within that team, we do have, a, or within that service, we have a specific team team for youth offending um, and I'm not in that specific team but I, have, I am aware that that route is mainly is the route that mainly young black boys do go through in London and sort of then trying to approach a mental health service where we we can see that they are struggling or that they're having difficulties with something but because of the route that they've come in they're so resistant to any support they don't they don't really want to know they they are um, quicker to disengage and and are really sort of mistrustful of professionals and of authority because you know even though we are not the police we are essentially tied to them through you know through this NHS service that we are and so we are lumped in the same bracket as them or I think the same with sort of not really wanting to talk about what's going on or what they what the difficulties what the difficulties are. Maybe they don't know what the difficulties are, or they've been told not to talk and not to share because that will make things worse from you know from older family members or if they're involved in gangs, then maybe you know coming from there they don't want to share, they don't want to want to say, um, and it's really really hard to then get them to see how we can help them with their mental health. Um, and how we can help them if they're, you know, they're struggling or slightly stressed or slightly anxious. But it doesn't mean they have to have a, you know, a diagnosis of something of, of, of a severe mental health issue. But just those difficulties we can see, and they, it's it's really hard, and it takes a lot of time for them to see that. And and unfortunately for some, they don't they don't see and they don't go down that route and they do disengage and end up sort of back in that cycle. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Let's go straight on to some of the, the, um, the, the uh, comments or questions. I said many of these are questions. I, I've got to kick, kick into this now. Kareen um, from Stanford asks, um, are there any signs and symptoms we should look out for if we suspect someone who may be suffering uh, from depression? Mm. Who wants to answer that? Go on. <laughs> I think it's really important, Pam, and certainly Corinne, um, not to get into the guessing game because we can see so many things with just looking at yourselves in the mirror. There's, you, you'll see things. I think um, if if Corinne is speaking about someone that's close to her or close to him, I don't know if it's him or her, it might be worth just asking them and just, you know, getting them to, to see if they could open up. I think it can become a bit of a dangerous game sometimes um, where we get into trying to spot particular signs, um, although there might be some that are obvious, but it's just, and I think that can often be harder with males that might not always lend, you know, they're not always that great in terms of talking about things and expanding on stuff. So often the best thing is to try and just maybe speak to that person if they're the person that you're worried about. But there are also really good online facilities out there as well. 
I mean, I've spoken about it before. It's called the Every Mind Matters. You can just put it into your own Internet Explorer. And it kind of gives you a bit of an idea of just sort of general things that you can do to kind of support um, your mental well-being. Because so I think as Cairo and certainly Sharon uh, mentioned before, the last few months have been, I mean, no one could have ever planned for that at all. No one, you know, not least, I know you started off with the Black Lives Matters, but that's on the back of talking about the higher numbers of deaths within COVID. That's on the back of just dealing with, you know, you would know someone that is close to you or relatively close to you that's been affected by a death with COVID. So there's a lot of bereavement going around. And then as Cairo mentioned before, outside of that, you know, you've got younger people who just find themselves not sure about what they want to do. You know, it's not just a narrative that people are in gangs. They've also, if you speak to younger people, you know, they would have known someone that's been harmed or even died. So there's lots going on. So I just think we also have a responsibility to make sure that we're getting the right information and not getting into sort of guesswork. Totally agree with you, Diana. I think you're on mute, Pam. Oh, you're muted, Pam. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, sorry about that. Um, Kareem, ask um, the advice is, um, to ask the person straight off. Talk to that person straight off the bat. This is the advice that's been given. Don't make a guessing game. Just talk to them. Winston from Hornsey asks, everyone has a downtime or feeling low. Why should we automatically believe we're going through some kind of psychosis? Sharon? Sharon. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I thought you were talking. I, I don't. You know, I just think sometimes people just need to be given space and just reminded mm -hmm. to stop. We're bombarded with information, technology, advertising, then all the COVID, the other you know things that you're having to deal with de daily, and um, the body's not meant to deal with all this. A Victorian wouldn't be able to deal with this. You know what we're dealing with daily. And just giving space, non-judgmental, just holding the space for them. Let them talk. I mean, and the, what I always suggested, okay, if they're in some really quite dramatic situation, you bring it right down, pair it right down. What can I change now? What can I do? The small steps at a time. So they feel, they start to feel more empowered and in control of their life. It's got spun out, you know. Um, and that's a wonderful way of just helping people slowly, slowly. It might take some time, but first you've got to build trust, you know, and, and really hold a safe space. But more than anything is nowadays, especially, it used to be bad backs. Now it's stress straight across the board is the first thing to knock people off of, out of work and then and really have problems getting back into employment or creating family problems and not to mention any abuse that might be happening in a family household, you know? So yeah. it is tragic. And, yeah. and it's and like Dr. Juliana would say, it's up to us as each as individuals to look out, notice somebody, if somebody's a little bit quiet, we're not meant, I don't say fix them, just give them space to just say how they're feeling. How are you doing? You know, we all need help one time or another, Yeah. but yeah. sometimes just doing that can make a huge difference. Okay. Huge. Let me go to the last one because we're running out of time. I'm, I'm probably going to point it to you, uh, Cairo. Teresa from Luton asks, shouldn't mental health organisations and clinical groups be putting more pressure on government to implement more initiatives and awareness programmes to perhaps focus and assist the young before the full impact of mental illness takes set? Yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah, it's especially working with sort of young people and, and them not really understanding what mental health is and, and we will get referrals in and I'll come in and, and I'll speak to them and most of what they're going through is quite normal for you know their developmental stage or where they're at and it's just sort of spiraled you know as Sharon said it's spiraled it's got out of control maybe you know the schools aren't really picking it up or family aren't picking it up and it's and it's where you know where do they go then they go straight to you know ideally to the the GP and the GP then makes a referral into us um but then just you know I'll do an assessment and just sitting and talking with them we can come up with actual solutions to their problems and I and I think that's what it's about it's just having that that time having that space to just 
show that you're there to support them and even asking them what what do they need what do they think that they need what is it that they need to change or would like to change um, and just having that you know, there are more pressure be on the government what initiatives if you got together group together what Teresa's asking is that shouldn't be more pressure on the government to to put more initiatives in place um to help them to help these young people a bit more from that early stage as you said um so shouldn't there be more things around the government yeah 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 no i think so I think um, I think schools is probably this place where we can reach these young people. And I think that the government should have more initiatives where we're, we're having education or psychoeducation sessions on just general mental health well-being, as you would with sort of physical health well-being and, um, you know, in the PHC, PSHE lessons and sexual education. Mental health should be in there as well because you're – you know, having everyone has mental health and everyone should be aware of what that means to look after themselves and have just a general um, well-being. There are charities that are doing this, but these are, you know, small charities that have started up because they've realised that there's a gap and actually it should be coming, it should be coming from higher up and feeding downwards. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Ladies, thank you ever so much for, for your time. Um, you, this is, should have been a double barrel, really, because there was so much more to say. And I know you guys have so much more to say, but, but you know, thank you ever so much for, for coming in. Cara Maynard, um, Juliana on Woomer and Sharon Bannister. Thank you ever so much. Take care, ladies. Take care of yourselves and thank you. Okay, uh, go for that short break now. And um, I think we're going to have something to do with um, our stomachs and this time to do with food. So see you shortly. Mm -hmm.